I pray that the Lord will help us. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there is a price to pay if immiscibles can mix together. There is always a price to pay. We should understand that our young people are under siege. We are living in very terrible times. Times in which the sacred canopy, that which years back guided thinking pattern, things or structures that were around people that helped people to formulate a religious or a godly worldview of life. Things like cultural values, family, extended family systems, religious institutions, the sense of the sacred, respect for things which are sacred, and a balance between belief and science. All these parameters are eroding very, very fast in our time. Today, cultural values are given away for individualistic tendencies that are in the postmodern um, world. Family systems are shifting from extended to nuclear. Religious institutions that were strong are becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. Today, people do not respect what is sacred anymore. And today, the only belief that some people know is science. If it cannot be proven, then they would not believe it. In such an environment, young people are left on their own on an expedition to discover their self as a lonely adventure. They are on their own figuring out what to do because the world has left them in many times to do what they want to do. And the more you allow people to do what you want to do, the more people think you are tolerant. The youth culture is under siege. Many of the young people are living without examples. And that is where we cry to our fathers that this is the time to pay the price, to make sure that you are working as a surfactant coming into the generation and bridging immiscibles together. Hallelujah. Now, when we talk about youth culture, it is constantly changing. Church leaders must always research the culture and make sure that we know what's up, we know what's going on. I mean, we cannot use ten, I mean, uh, facts about young people 10 years ago to minister to the young people today. We are looking at 2033, and I tell you that we have no idea the kind of sociocultural, technological parameters that will be shaping in the world by 2033. We have no idea. All what I want to say is that the youth culture is constantly changing. And because it is changing, it is very difficult to prescribe ways and methods of handling any generation. But we can learn from Jesus some qualities that will help us to engage every generation the way they are. Now to the adult generation, welcome to this Facebook generation, this Twitter, Instagram, Telegram. Not the old version of Telegram. I'm talking about the new Telegram. And many adults are wondering what that is. We are in a generation where things which looked impossible have become possible. And so sometimes when young people listen to uh, um, adults talking about impossibilities, they laugh at the impossibilities of adults because they think that what they think is impossible is so possible by some of the tools that they have around us. I mean, we are talking about a generation that is so difficult to understand. These are the people who can be reading a book preparing for their final exams at the same time having earphones in their ears listening to music and they are behind the television watching Barcelona playing Mamelody Sundowns. Yay! And at the same time, checking food that is on fire. And you look at them and you wonder, are these people serious? What are they doing? And somehow they survive. They pass their exams and they go through. What kind of generation are we dealing with? The picture-taking generation. I bet you that today when we close, if you are an adult, some young people will walk to you and come and ask you, can I take selfie with you? They are taking pictures everywhere and posting it on Facebook every time. This kind of generation, if we want to follow the changes, we will never come to an end. There are more things coming. By 2033, more things would have come, and life would never be the same. But then as fathers, I stand here today as 
a young person, and I also stand here today as a father. And I want to speak to fathers in the house, the spiritual fathers and mothers. It is time to look at Jesus and the price he paid and be ready to pay similar prices. I just mentioned four things. The younger people are still settling down. I'll be coming to talk to you very soon. Four things about Jesus' way of coming along with people that may be helpful to us as leaders, as adults who are mentoring young people. First, we realize that Jesus deepened his relationship with the people he met. He had a deepening approach. He asked questions that made people open up for more engagement. There are people who could never have been able to relate with Jesus. But Jesus asked them certain questions and that opened them up. But Timios, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And that started an engagement after Bartimaeus cried for help. Jesus wanted him to really get to the core of his needs. Share your stories with young people. And these things make a huge impact in their lives, especially when we are sharing stories, let's not only share the positive sides. Many young people are going through stuff. And when you share your struggles as well with them, then they know that this same Jesus who has helped you can help them as well so that they do not look down upon the journey that God is going on with them. The issue is that if we do not engage deeply the young people around us, we would never know what's going on. Because I tell you what, today's younger people have a world beneath. It's like an underground city where you need to be admitted to know what is going on there. They can have a facade, a life on the surface that you would appreciate so that you do not cast them away. They can present a version of themselves which is agreeable with what you want to see. But then they may have a world beneath that you may never discover. It is only when you engage deeply, it's only when you go down that you know the real issues. And I tell you, there are many parents, there are many leaders who have no idea who their young people are. They think they know them, but you do not know them. Jesus deepened his relationships with people. It goes beyond, oh, hello, how are you? And then that's all. No. Jesus asked questions, critical questions that made the, the people open up. Secondly, Jesus was particularizing. He was very particular with people. No stereotyping. He understood people from their backgrounds. When he met Zacchaeus, he dealt with Zacchaeus from his background. When he met the woman with the issue of blood, he dealt with her from her background. And I tell you that there are many young people who are bleeding already. And if only we would look at people in their context, if we would not use one method fit all, but we would take time to engage, we'll be amazed that there is work we can do to help this agenda. Jesus was hospitable. He deeply cared for the needs of others. He joined them in table fellowship. He really shared his life with them. And finally, Jesus was patient, very patient. He was ready to accommodate their inefficiencies until they got him. Look at someone like Peter. Peter took a long time to really get him. Even after his eyes were open and he saw that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Just a few verses after, Peter was saying something else. He took a long time. Jesus was patient to accommodate his inefficiencies. And we see that also between God and Samuel. Look at the story of the boy Samuel. Eli coached him. You see, the one who is talking to you, he is the Lord. When you hear the voice again, say, Master, speak. Thy servant is listening. He taught the young boy the protocols. This is how we address God. When God came to speak to him, Samuel just said, speak. Your servant is listening. He forgot the protocols. He didn't add the master. Go back and check it. He didn't add the Lord. But God knew his heart. 
Because the older people who knew the protocols and could say the right things were wrong in their hearts. And God was already rejecting them. But this was a boy who did not know the protocols, who did not know how to be politically correct. He didn't know how to say it right or do it right. But yet he had a heart for God. And God wanted to move with him. The young people around may not know all that needs to be done right. But God knows their heart. If only we will be patient with them, they will get us eventually. Life is moving so fast, ladies and gentlemen, that systemic abandonment of young people have become the order of the day. Parents and institutions are, are using a one-size-fits-all approach so that those who do not fit are left behind. And so many youth feel objectified and patronized. Many of the youth, it's only when it's time to arrange chairs. It's only when it's time for some work, some hard work, that we remember that the glory of the young man is his strength. And he comes and do the hard work. And when we finish, we push them aside. They are not part of the deal. May the Lord help us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing with a young earth. The average age on earth today is 28.3 years. That is, if we add all the ages and share it equally, everyone is going to be a young person. 28 years. That is the average age on earth. The average age in Africa is 19.4 years. Africa is the youngest continent in the world. In fact, the 10 countries with the youngest population are all in Africa, ranging from Niger, where the average age is 14.4, to Burkina Faso, the land of upright people, whose average age is 17 years old. We are dealing with a young continent, very young continent. Now, what does that mean to us, ladies and gentlemen? Our duty as mentors is to transform this massive mission field into a mission force so that God would use them for what he wants to do. And as fathers, as we do these things, the Lord will continue to bless us and strengthen us. Now, quickly open with me to Psalm 110, verse 1 to 4, as I speak to the young people briefly, and then we close. Psalm 110, verse 1 to 4. When you read the Hebrew Bible, the Bible says that this is a Psalm of David. And David opens Psalm 110, verse 1, this way. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. Hallelujah. Now this was David the king talking about the Lord speaking to his Lord. And so definitely none of the lords in this context was referring to David himself. And so I get the understanding that David as a prophet was allowed to enter into the supreme councils of heaven where he saw an engagement between father and son. Praise the Lord where he saw a discussion going on between father and son. God the Father speaking to the son that sits at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus Christ came to conquer sin, Satan, and the world systems. These are the enemies Jesus came to fight. Praise the Lord. And so David as a prophet had insight into this discussion that went on in the heavenlies. The father promising the son on oath that relax, you have finished your, your assignment. Relax, sit down until I make all your enemies your footstool. When Jesus resurrected, there was so much work yet to be done. Yet, he has the encouragement from the Lord that sit until I make all your enemies your footstool. The verse 2, the promise is that the Lord will send forth the rulership, the mighty scepter of Emmanuel, the Messiah, our king of kings, from Zion, from Jerusalem, his influence will reach the ends of the earth. And the father encourages him, rule in the midst of your enemies. This assignment that I sent you would not fail. It would succeed. You would eventually rule in the midst of your enemies. How was that going to happen? Verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. 
in holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. Interesting. Now I check the Hebrew terminology of the term um, offering themselves freely or willing. The King James said, your people shall be willing. And it is the word nedabot in the Hebrew. Now nedabot has um, words like free will offering, freely or plentifully giving yourself to something. And so if you look at the King James, the King James says that your people shall be willing NKJV, your people shall offer themselves freely. Hormon Christian, your people will be volunteers. And I like that one. Your people will be volunteers. NIV says that your troops will be willing. The MEV says that your people will follow you. And the Common English Bible says that your people will stand ready. God has promised his son that the assignment will be completed. Because in these days of his power, when the Holy Spirit has been poured on earth, his people would be willing. His people would offer themselves freely to this assignment. And they would offer themselves early in their lives, at the dawn of their day. The youth would offer their deal, their vitality, their resourcefulness, their giftedness unto the Lord to make sure that this assignment is completed so that the promise that the Father has made to the Son will come to pass, that he will rule in the midst of his enemies. And the reason why the father is asking the son to sit is that there is an army coming. And I came to challenge the young people here that as part of the people of God, it's not only young people who are the people of God, as part of the people of God who will stand ready, who will be willing to offer themselves freely for this end time assignment until the battle is won, are the young people. Are there young people in the house? Oh, give the Lord a shout! And I tell you what, these people are coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers. People who could have made something for themselves. People who probably were champions in their own donkey-seeking ventures elsewhere. But then, because of this promise of the father to the son, Young people are offering themselves everywhere, forgetting about what they will get in this world and offering themselves so that this promise shall be fulfilled. They are coming from all over the places. May we not abuse them, but may we use them for what God is calling them to be. Young people, listen to me. God is looking for an end time militia. Militia are people who are not professionally trained, People who haven't gone to Bible school, people who don't have it, but people who have a heart, who are ready to do something. And God is calling an end time army, an army who will be strong. Such people are not looking for money, fame, popularity, glamour, titles, pleasure, ecclesiastical positions, or whatever. But all that they look for is to seek the reward of serving God still. They are people who want to make sure that in these days of his power, in these days of his power, the enemy of Christ, the enemy of the church, sin, Satan, and the world shall be overcome. And he says that they would offer themselves freely in holy garments. Holiness, very, very important for the young people. If you're a young person and you want to volunteer for this end time militia assignment, holiness is the typical mark of such people who will be part of this army. And he says that they will offer themselves from the womb of the dawn. In other words, early in life, they will give their hearts and their passions to the assignment of the Lord. They will give their resourcefulness to the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the days of his power. And the younger people listening to me, God is calling you to offer yourselves freely unto the Lord. Now let me say this as I close. The challenges that our fathers and our mothers faced in their time were tough enough for them. In our generation and towards 2033, we are going to face heavier challenges because according to prophetic declaration in Isaiah chapter 60, the darkness will deepen. Darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness will cover the people. And so what we need as young people to shine in our time it's not the anointing of our fathers. And so I thank God that in this meeting we have established 
that we are not wearing anybody's shoes, but we are walking in the footsteps of our fathers. Elijah knew so well that the double portion that Elisha was asking for was a difficult thing. In fact, he did not have it. The fathers don't have what we are looking for. It's only God who has it. And the role of the fathers is to lead us to the art God who can give us the double portion that we would need in our generation to be able to overcome the challenges that we will face. Elijah understood it. And so he turned Elisha's focus to the captain of Israel's host, the father, the father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, the whole entourage that came, the one who was riding on the horse, and the entourage. Elijah turned the attention of Elisha to God who alone can give him the double portion. Young people, listen to me. We are here with our fathers. John says that I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. Our fathers know God and they can give us a God connect. But it is not they who are going to give us the anointing we are looking for. Make sure that you contact the God of our fathers. And as we contact him, he will release the double portion unto us and we will be able to shine in our time. These are the days of his power and his people shall be willing. Young people rise up and seek the power of the Holy Spirit. Tongue talking, doing signs and wonders, living right and holy. Reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And most importantly for me, taking over the marketplace with kingdom ethics, business politics, um, arts and entertainment, the media, you know, um, academia, you know, family, uh, life education, um, ministry, and everywhere. Let us scatter everywhere so that Habakkuk 2.14 would be realized in our time. How many people are ready to be enlisted in the troops of the Lord? These are the days of his power, and his people shall be willing. As I close, if you feel that you want to offer yourselves freely, not by compulsion, that is what the Lord is doing in our time. People who are giving themselves freely to the assignment of the Lord. They don't need to become pastors, but they can cast out devils. They don't need any title, but they can preach and get people saved. They do not need to be recognized anywhere, but they are ready to go for missions and bring people into the kingdom. If you are ready to be part of this end time army, shall you rise to your feet at this time? I just want to see you. How many volunteers do we have to make sure that the promise of the father to the son shall be accomplished. Then verse 4, he says that the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. Wonderful. Shall you close your eyes? Those of you standing, just close your eyes. There will be a time for intergenerational impartation and blessing. I just want you to stand there in the, for 30 seconds, just stand there and reflect. And make sure nobody pulled you up. Make sure you stood up on your own. His people shall be willing. Offer themselves freely. These are the days of his power, ladies and gentlemen. And as you stand there, I want you to talk to the Lord in your heart. We will not have time to pray for a long time now, but keep the fire. More are coming. And at the appropriate time, the heavens will be opened and the fathers will touch us with a touch of their God. And we shall see God and catch something fresh from him. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for a season like this. I stand with my brothers and sisters and we say that we have heard your voice. These are the days of your power. The power of the Holy Spirit has been poured without measure on earth and we are ready to offer ourselves freely unto you. We are willing to go into all parts of the world, safe or unsafe, because this agenda must be fulfilled. You have sworn that you will not change your mind. And so keep us by your grace. Help us to have the patience to be trained by our fathers. Help us not only to be willing, but to be willing and obedient so that we shall eat the fruit of the land. Help us that this fire would never die and cause us that ahead of 2033, we would achieve the focus of Empower 21 to your glory. As we offer our energies, continue to keep us safe and add grace unto welcome grace. In Jesus' name, amen.